to software engineering, 2FA3, discrete mathematics with applications too. I am Bill Farmer, and we're going to complete the topic of predicate logic today. Last time we were talking about Genson style proof systems. And these proof systems fall into two types natural deduction systems and sequence systems. And we gave last time a sequence system. So let me remind you of what a sequence is. It's a ordered pair of a list of formulas with another list of formulas. And we write it like this with the single turnstile, which symbolizes proving. So basically, we're, the idea is we can prove V from U. Now, the meaning of a sequence uh, can be given as follows. We can define the value of a sequence in a model with a variable assignment as the value of this expression. And this is the expression we get by taking the conjunction of all the members of U and taking the disjunction of all the members of V, and the formula says that the conjunction implies the disjunction. And for that reason, we will say that a sequent is valid precisely if this formula is valid. Or in other words, it's valid in a model if this formula is valid in a model. Uh, so last time we presented a Genson style sequent system for FOL, but I I failed to emphasize the fact that it was for FOL without equality. We don't have any machinery for reasoning about equality. And remember, equality is part of the, uh, equality is basically a logical constant in our logic in FOL. So anyway, last time we presented this Genson style proof system, it had one, one logical axiom uh, and a whole bunch of rules of inference, and we had rules of inference, pairs of rules of inference for each uh, Boolean operator and each quantifier. And then we talked about what proofs are, and we gave examples of proofs, several examples. So now we're ready to talk about the meta theorems of G, this Genson style proof system. So remember, G proves theorems, and theorems about G, we call these meta theorems. Now, let our sequent here be any sequent of a signature sigma, as long as that sequent does not include equality. Now, uh, one thing that's true, that's actually quite useful, is that for every rule of inference of G in every model M, M is a model of the premises of the rule, if, if and only if M is a model of the conclusion of the rule. So this is unusual. Usually we don't have if and only if we have implies. So usually if we have a rule of inference like this, from A and B we can infer C. Usually what that means is if A is valid in a model, and B is valid in a model, then C is valid in a model. It, and it doesn't go the other way. So truth flows in only one direction. So usually, if C is valid in a model, that does not mean necessarily that both A and B are, are valid. But in this case, we have if and only if. We have truth flowing both ways for our rules of inference. If if we have models, if we have a model of A and B, then that will be a model of C. And if we have a model of C, it will be a model of A and B. Um, now we also have two very nice theorems, soundness and completeness. Soundness says if we can prove this sequence, that implies that that sequence is valid. In other words, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be true, it's going to be valid in every model. And we have completeness, which says that if the, if the uh, sequent is valid, then there will be a proof of it. Now, this completeness theorem requires that no variable is both bound and free in our sequent. And 
that's really not much of a restriction because you can always write down the formulas you want to prove without using a variable as being both bound and free. So I want to illustrate why this happens. If we look at this formula, this is clearly valid because it says that, it says that uh, for all x, p of x, x holds, uh, it says that this um, holds will imply that p of x, x holds. Now, the reason uh, this is true is because if a universal statement holds, then every instance of it, and p of x, x is an instance of, of for all x, p of x, x. But now if we're trying to prove this, so if, if I was going to start with this, and trying to prove this sequence, I probably want to use, the only thing I can use really, is for all left. Now for all left says I can replace x with any variable that's not free in here, free anywhere else. Well, the variable I want to replace x with is x. That way I can get this. And that will be a logical axiom and I'll be done. But the problem is I'm not allowed to replace x with x because x is free. So, so what we get here, let me use a different color. This does not work. So we can't, there isn't a way of proving this. Uh, but like I said, this is not a big deal because we can always start with our variables either being all free or all bound. Okay, so I mentioned that this system G doesn't work with equality. We can modify G so it does work with equality. We get G sub E. This works perfectly well with equality, but we have to add some more axioms. We have to add axioms that are similar to the axioms that we had for, for our Hilbert style system H. So we have the, the first one is reflexivity, the second one is for symmetry, and the third one is for transitivity. So these, these are for an equivalence relation. They basically guarantee that equality is an equivalence relation. And then these last two are for a congruence. Now if we have a congruence, that means we can substitute equals for equals. And so these two axioms uh, are like very, like I said, very similar to the ones we had for script H. Uh, the first one says if we have a function application and we change the arguments to new arguments as long as these new arguments are all equal, then we'll get a new function application which will be equal to the other one. In other words, we can do equals for equals. And um, the axiom for predicate applications is similar. If we have a predicate application and we change its arguments to other arguments that are equal to the original arguments, that's what this says, then that will imply the result of applying this predicate to those new arguments. So this, this uh, system, G sub E, it's sound and it's complete. Remember, G was sound and complete only for formulas that did not involve equality. G sub E is is sound and complete for all formulas. Okay, so the last part of this topic, we give a summary. And I want to contrast uh, two different kinds of notions. We have truth notions and proof notions. So truth notions are, are deal with the semantics of FOL, and proof notions deal with what we can prove in a proof system for FOL. So we have this nice correspondence between these semantic elements and these syntactic elements. Uh, the reason we say syntactic here is because proving is a syntactic operation. We're basically taking expressions, these proof trees or proofs, and we're manipulating them. So truth corresponds to proof, 
and semantic consequence corresponds to syntactic consequence. Remember, both semantic consequence and syntactic consequence are different forms of logical consequence. Then, if we say that A is valid, that means it's going to get a truth value of true in every model, that corresponds to A is a theorem in a proof system. In other words, it's something we can prove in the proof system uh, from no assumptions. And in the first case, we write this. This means A is valid. We write this. This means that A is a theorem in a proof system. And then we can say A is valid in T. That corresponds to saying A is a theorem of T and P. A is a theorem of T and P means we can prove A in P using the axioms of T. And so we have this corresponding to this. And finally, um, we, can, we have T is satisfiable corresponds to T is consistent in P. T is satisfiable means T has a model. T is consistent in P means T, we can't, not everything is a theorem of T. Um, now, for some logics, these two, two uh, categories of concepts are identical. So in other words, semantic consequence is equivalent to syntactic consequence, or another way of saying it, whenever we're, we, something will be a semantic consequence if and only if it's also a syntactic consequence. Likewise, we can say that uh, a formula is valid if and it only is a theorem in our proof system. Uh, now, we can also say T is satisfiable if and only T is consistent in the proof system. Um, now, the logics for which these two notions are equivalent are the, the, the most common no logics are propositional logic, which Bernays showed uh, this equivalence in 1918, first row logic, which Guerrero showed in 1930, and simple type theory for use of particular semantics, Henkin showed in 1950. Simple type theory is what people also call classical higher order logic. So in normal mathematics, people often talk about these two different groups of concepts of being equivalent. Uh, that, that is not always true, but it is true for these logics. Uh, and in some logics, these notions are distinct from each other. OK, so one more thing to talk about. This is the fundamental form of a mathematical problem. Most mathematical problems can be expressed in the following form. T, double turnstile A, and what that means is A is valid in T, which means that A is valid in every model of T. So um, most, formula, most mathematical problems can be expressed in this way. And if we want to solve the problem, we really have three ways of doing it. The first is, I'm going to call it model checking. That is the most obvious way. Because what this means is that for every model of T, A, that model will be a model of A. The models of T are all models of A, in other words. So what we have to do with model checking is we check that A, that, that uh, if we have a model of T, then A will be valid in that model, or in other words, that model will be a model of A. So we verify for each model of T, that model is a model of A. And this means we got to basically check every model. And this is not a big deal if there's only a small number of models, but if there's a gigantic number of models, or even worse, there's an infinite number of models for T, then this isn't going to be a practical approach. And the approach that we like to do is either two or three. Now, two is we want to show that for a sound proof system, we can prove A from the axioms of T in P. In other words, we can show, like we had up here, that A is a theorem of T in P. 
So, so in other words, we're going to solve this problem by solve this problem by proving. We come up with a proof, and the let's say there is no proof. Let's say this is this is actually not true. Well, that brings us to the third approach. We come up with a counterexample. We come up with a model of T, which is not a model of A. In other words, it's a model of not A, the negation of A. So when people are trying to solve a problem, they, they actually use both of these methods. They try to prove it, and if they don't have much luck then, they try to find a counterexample. If they can't find a counterexample, they go back to trying to prove it. And they go back and forth between these two until they either find a counterexample or they find a proof. Okay, so that completes this topic of predicate logic. I hope you have enjoyed it. So long, until next time.